when Laird Cobius got, re got released, Ruvidus got activated as well and maybe started high. There, there was that oh, yeah, they follow scent trails like an ant. Hybrid, hybrid bigger, but I mean, with the, like the, like I said, with, with the winds, I mean, the beetle does fly. I don't know if anybody saw in the in the, the one in the bile. There were little wings coming out. So, I mean, what was interesting, and Blake might have mentioned it when we left, but we we found the the beetle on really so, sort of isolated trees. We we would we went into this one property. Uh, did you talk about this one? We we, we went to this one property. Um, that someone who had responded to the survey. We put like a. a a Google survey on our extension Facebook page and just said, Hey, if you have hemlocks on your property and don't mind us coming out and looking, you know, please let us know. So we went out to this property in the middle of Bethel. There weren't, there, there it wasn't like a hemlock forest. forest. There were just some isolated individual hemlocks on this property. And the guy said, yeah, be careful. It's hunting season. Don't walk off the trail. You know, you know. so we walk up just to this one isolated tree, nothing around it except, except beaches and sugar maples and oaks. One, and we found three beetles on this one isolated, one isolated specimen. So, I mean, it was just it was really striking to see that. And, and I guess because of the the you know the winds that we do have and the number of releases. Now, one thing we didn't really track, or that you maybe not didn't have. Uh, there, there were individuals in the high country who purchased their own beetles, right. who actually bought packages of beetles and released them on their own properties. Now for that, we really didn't have that source of, of, of data because who knows where they, where they actually, you know, uh, where they actually released them. But just in the, you know, in the range, in the range of the map where we were able to go, it was just really striking and impressive to, uh, to see how much, you know, how many there, there were. We were sort of, I mean, I was a little, you know, tongue in cheek and nervous, like, what if we don't find any? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, what if we're, they're not there? You know, as an extension, as the extension office, if we're not finding them, you know, when clients call, we really can't say, well, there's no, you know, for, don't worry about your forest hemlocks. Right. But, but, you know, now we can, I feel very confident in saying that. At this point, um, I'd like to get a, a yes. Did you stop at the uh, the border? Did, or I know you've got one place where they released looks like ash. Did you go into ash at all, or or Avery, or did, was I the mean, scope just to be Watauga? Because it looks like they could easily be um, across. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the county border is of course just a made up figurative line, so it's not like there's they're going to stop right there. So of course they're going to spread a little bit. We had one point in Trade, Tennessee that we sampled at, um, of course, because we were kind of going back into Fleetwood and then back over Elk Knob, I think is the mountain. Yep. There's a strong indication that it, it's just throughout the high country too. And of course, we just tried to focus on Watauga County being Watauga County Extension. But I think in the future, as we continue surveying, um, I plan to survey Ash County this fall and kind of have that kind of data released too, because I don't know, I, I don't think Dr. McDonald's released as heavy in Ash County. So what I was kind of hoping to see is if we could catch one of the border lines, like see um, the rate of spread a little bit more clearly, because um, that would give us a more accurate representation of how fast it is spreading. It was just convenient for his for his study for the scope because he did a little research project yeah. too. It was really nice and convenient package to for for he. I'm so, just so he go home to Todd and start meeting. <laughs> They're there. He got the uh, an undergraduate student research award for, at ASU for this project too. Oh. So. <laughs> I see you, Lear. So we refer to Rubidus. You want me to come up? Yeah, come on up. So when I'm you refer to Rubidus. Is that our native Laricobius that was already here? Okay. Um, that fed on pine bark delt. It was a biotype. And then my other question is, um, have you been looking around in uh, Ash County? Any? I have a little bit. Um, I've sampled Laurel Springs a little bit where the research station is. And, you know, I found Laricobius there. So um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. So, okay, what, what happens if you, you have hemlocks on your property and you're over there in Avery or whatever, or Ash or wherever? So, is there a poaching law? <laughs> poaching beetles? Now, that's a, that's a big question, because I know, 
<laughs> University of Kentucky poaches beetles. Because what I, I, I'll tell well, here's what happened. Okay, so this is what I did out west, is all the sites that I had that weren't behind gated communities, I, there's lots of military people out there, and I'm a military brat, so I'm not afraid of army bases or nothing like that, right? So one of my spots, I have this guy, he looks just like Ed Harris, retired Marine, and I say, if you ever see people pounding on these trees, I want you to call me up. Oh. So the, a year later, all of a sudden he calls me up. He's like, hey, there's a guy, his name's John. John goes, there's a guy over there pounding on trees. I said, will you go and find out who it is? Oh, yeah, I'll go over and find out who it is. So it was a guy that the University of Kentucky had hired to go around where I had collected, and they GPS the sites. And I don't mind if they're going to do that, but the thing that they don't realize is with the sites that we were collecting last year don't have beetles on them anymore, right? You know what I mean? As everything moves around. So I called up my compatriot, John O'Bricky, who was the department head at the University of Kentucky, and I said, I don't mind if you guys want to collect, but we've got to be coordinated. I, I don't want to be, I'm not going to stomp on your toes, and I never meant to, and I've supplied them with all their beetles anyway. Well, they thought they could get it cheaper, but they couldn't, right? Because they didn't know enough to do it. So but that's. We could put on a gray wig that's got a ponytail about. And yeah, and look like, yeah, right. About six yeah. foot tall. And hey, we're right in the game. Did you answer the question? Is there a poaching law? No. <laughs> well, there, yeah, there is. <laughs> it's the three S's shoot, shovel, and shut up. <laughs> one, one more competitor out of the way. As the universities and scientists find out more and more about this, they will, they will want to come here. Oh, yeah. We're like the epicenter of right. these we are. people in New England, Pennsylvania, the you know, Midwest that are seeing all this. They want to come down here because we do have, if you're in, you know, and I don't know, there's, but if you go to Pennsylvania or New York, Cornell's working on this a lot. Um, I don't know if they have the density of predator that we do not and yet they want to come down here and, and they want to collect and and we are cautiously optimistic about letting them or not letting them well what we need to do with it with this group in the room here what we want to do is we want to get organized and we can sell beetles and you can and the hemlock nursery industry is back so there's a lot that we can do here, and if we do it right, then everybody has, it's all good business at arm's length, and everybody's happy. But if you have people like University of Kentucky trying to sneak around behind my back, I'm going to call them on it. You know what I mean? It, you're not going to, you're not, we have to, this is the same thing that happened in organic agriculture 20 years ago when we were scrounging off each other to get a planter or something like that, you know, is we all need to work to, we're, we're sitting in an, we're 20 years ahead of anybody else because we just stayed with it. So that's where we're at right now is we can coordinate. If you're going to sell a hemp, here's an idea that Lear had. Lear called me up and he said, can't we sell a hemlock that has adelgids and beetles on it and, and I'll put a limb bag on there and it's like, yeah, that you've got everything all in one thing. You're planting that and you are done. Yeah, that's yeah, my idea is to have like a little hemlock, maybe potted or bare root. Yeah. That we could have a delgin on. I've got a limb bag, we can make a limb you know, bag. And I can GPS that thing, do you? Right. <laughs> Well, that's why I really want Lear to come up and share his perspective. Yeah. So Lear was, was kind of the tip of the spear when it came to sort of uh, applications of, of all of this knowledge in the landscape. I know I know, you know I started Extension and fairly soon after when the Adelgid thing hit, uh, Lear was going to conferences and uh, he had, uh, conferences and workshops and learning all that he could. Um, about the adelgid and, and treatment, because of that was the that was the need of the entire of the entire industry. You know, at, at that point, everybody in the game wanted to know the, you know the latest and greatest. And, and uh, I thought I thought um, um, you know Lear was an extension agent that who, who that just never was. Yeah. Uh, because he was <laughs> he was using the best research research based information that he could to then pass along to to his client. So I. I Asked him to come and talk today just of how you know this dynamic works from the landscaper's perspective and dealing with 
the myriad of clients and forest landowners and others that we work with here in, in, the, in the high country. All right.